Ready? Yeah. Okay, we're ready. Um. <laughs> Good day, everybody. It's, it's time for the next talk, so if you could t please take a seat. I'm really pleased to introduce Stephen Cobb from ESAT. His talk is on sizing cybercrime incidents and accidents, hints and allegations. And before he starts, I wanted to give a quick little VB um, tidbit about his Steve. He first spoke at Virus Bulletin in 1994, and that was in Jersey. And his talk then was on Windows NT. I've come a long way since 94, Steve. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Well, thank you very much, yes. Yes, it was on Windows NT security, which was possibly an oxymoron, but. Um, I appreciate you uh, staying here for this, for uh, the run up to lunchtime. Uh, this is, I think, a, a topic that our industry sometimes loses focus of. What is the size of the problem we're trying to solve? Not all information security is a problem of cybercrime, but cybercrime is a problem for information security. And if somebody says, well, how big is the problem? It's often difficult to come up with uh, an answer. I'll start out with a quote that kind of addresses this. Stop wasting money on measuring cybercrime, spend it on the police instead. Anybody know who said that? I, I, if I repeated it with a Scottish accent, would that help? Uh, that was Ross Anderson. Uh, commenting actually on a, on a study that I mentioned in, in the paper, uh, and by the way, what I'm gonna talk about today is, is kind of highlights from the paper that are in the proceedings. Stop wasting money uh, on measuring cybercrime. I think there's a good case for saying we have wasted money on some pretty rubbish reports about cybercrime. Spend it on the police instead, definitely. I'm definitely all for putting more money into law enforcement, finding bad guys, catching bad guys, locking up the bad guys, of which we are doing some, but not enough. The problem is if you ask for more money for law enforcement, people are going to say, well, what's your justification? And if you spend more money on law enforcement, they're going to say, how well did it work? And that kind of involves saying how big the cybercrime problem is or how much you've reduced cybercrime. So there is this issue of measurement we need to address. So basically, how much is there? What does it cost us? And if you're in a rush, you're hungry, you need to go, I'll give you the answer very quickly. The quick version is too much. Yeah, we know that there's too much cybercrime. There's nobody going, well, maybe a little bit more, you know, bring it on. I don't think so. Um, if there's anybody in the audience who's not in the information security business, I'd like to say that we don't see cybercrime as a career benefit, as a, as a job uh, guarantee. I think a lot of us would rather do something else than deal with cybercrime. Uh, we do not welcome the next new wave of malware. We kind of loathe the next new wave of malware. Uh, we'd really like to do something more productive than deal with criminals who are abusing the technology. I think a lot of us got into this because we like the technology. We'd like to be able to use it without stupid things showing up pretending to be from somebody else like the message I just got from my bank, which really wasn't from my bank, um, and I nearly fell for it. So what's the total cost of cybercrime? This gentleman is, you may recognize, uh, General Keith Alexander, who was until recently the head of the NSA. Uh, this man had tens of billions of dollars of annual budget at his disposal. So you, you'd think, wow, man, he, he'd be able to do some research on this. He'd know how big this problem was. His answer, one trillion. All right. Cyber attacks cost us one trillion dollars. And where did he get that from? Did he get it from research? No, it was in a press release. McAfee did a study in 2009, which did not contain the number $1 trillion, but when they were putting out the press release, somebody thought they could do a little bit of math, spice it up a little bit. Out comes the $1 trillion number. President Obama has repeated the $1 trillion number. The $1 trillion number just really doesn't exist. And mentioning uh, Ross, by the way, a couple of years ago, uh, Tyler presented the study that uh, Ross led on the cost of cybercrime, still probably, he presented it here at Virus Bulletin or Virus Bulletin when it was in Dallas, I think. Uh, still, I think, the best study. It has hundreds of billions in there, but not a trillion. So why measure cybercrime? 
These six points were uh, kind of agreed on in a symposium in Oxford about five years ago that was called to address the problem of cybercrime, but they actually apply across all kinds of crime. All kinds of crime needs to be measured um, for these very good reasons. I've got one in particular which applies very much to people who are trying to protect information systems, and that is uh, the risk manager. Risk management process requires inputs, and if you look at, say, NIST 800, uh, the standard uh, used in a lot of, referenced in a lot of regulations, and in the States anyway, there are a couple of pieces of information you need to assess a particular uh, threat to your system, the likelihood of occurrence, and the magnitude of impact. How much is there? How often does it happen? And what's the cost? What's it going to do? So this chart is in the paper. Just kind of a summary of who needs this information. It's not like if we studied the cybercrime problem and tried to measure it, nobody would be interested. There are a lot of people interested. Uh, when I was writing this, I found that uh, criminal justice, uh, the judiciary, they're interested. You know, because if you're going to punish somebody for a crime, knowing how prevalent the crime is is kind of important. And there are a lot of people who would like the answers to the questions as to how much crime there is. And if you study crime, which I'm actually doing right now at a university uh, in England in the criminology department, you find there can be good news. So this is meat space crime, real crime, physical crime, um, larceny, theft, burglary, car theft. In the United States, uh, crimes per 100,000 people, so it's adjusted for population. And you can see that in the 60s and 70s and 80s, oh, it was getting bad. We were having crime wave upon crime wave. But then it started to get better, and it's actually come down a lot. And there is less <coughs> property crime in America. So you know, maybe if we studied cybercrime and we were studying it, we could see, oh, it went down. We can only hope. So when do we start measuring crime? Uh, interestingly, uh, not that long ago, uh, in the 1700s, people started to count things. How many people are there? How many people were born? And how many went to school? And so on. Um, this gentleman in France decided to go and get the statistics for all of the districts in France. And he kind of correlated them. And it was the first time somebody had done this. And they found, shocker, it wasn't the ignorant peasants or the areas where there was less education, where there was more crime, property crime. It was in the areas of France where there was more education. Not necessarily cause and effect. Very interesting, though. And he actually um, had printed the very first infographic, I think. And this thing, when it's printed, is huge. It's in color. And it's an annotated set of maps showing the amount of education, the amount of crime, and so on and so forth in the different parts of France in the 1800s. But there are many challenges when you start to count crime, because what is a crime? You know, is it something that gets reported? Hey, somebody stole my car. Really? Or did you just lose it? Um, crimes are investigated. OK, it's a real crime because we went and looked. We couldn't find the car. Uh, it's definitely been stolen. Or we actually caught the person who stole the car. We proved the crime. And that's going to be a statistic. And obviously, statistics these days are kept on all of those in regular physical space crimes. But also, it was found decades ago that not all crime was reported, so it might make sense to ask people. And certainly in the US and the UK, tens of thousands of households are surveyed every year to see what their experience of crime has been. However, it's true that some crime, uh, as my friend Mish Bay put it, just doesn't get found out. There are crimes of which nobody, except the committer of the crime, knows about. So we call that in criminology the dark figure of crime. It'll always be there. You know, so we're never going to actually measure all of the crime. But we can agree on what a particular thing is. Is it a crime? Does it get reported? Does it have a name? And can we count the numbers of it? Computer crime measurement began, I think, in the 70s. SRI started to collect just case studies of abuse. And Don Parker. Uh, put out, I think, the first computer crime book in 1976 that collected these. And by 1980, there were enough, maybe a dozen different studies of crime for a gentleman, John Tabor, who 
I don't know what, where he is or what happened to him, but he wrote this long analysis of uh, the different crime studies that were out there, and he was not happy. Uh, he was really upset that this term abuse had been used, and, and the term abuse was used because some things weren't actually crimes, right? Before the various crime acts were passed, they were just bad things that people did with computers. And, but he didn't like the fact that these were confused. He felt that there were companies had an agenda to try and make more of computer crime than was really the case. He also pointed out that if there is a crime story put out there, it will persist, potentially despite the data. And I give you the $1 trillion cost of cyber attacks. right? And another one was the 80-20 rule. Somebody, somebody, I think, from the FBI in the 1980s said, oh, 80% of computer fraud is internal. And that then, every year, people said, is it still 80? Is it 50-50? As more external attacks happen, people go, oh, no, it's 50-50 now. Now it's 80-20 the other way, which is actually not the numbers you really want, because it only takes one Snowden, and internal attacks are much bigger than external attacks. So. Some of you may remember some of these from the past. Uh, if you're very old, you might remember that the UK Audit Commission started uh, looking at computer fraud in local authorities. Uh, and they did that every three years for a number of years. When I wrote my first computer security book, they had to put a number of studies out there. Uh, then CSI, uh, Computer Security Institute, sadly no more. Uh, they started in 96, and they developed uh, kind of a model you do a study of crime. They did one with some people from the FBI. You put it out there. You held a hearing. They were actually uh, in hearings on uh, Capitol Hill and put out a press release, and you get a lot of attention. And they started doing those. They did those for 15 years, and then somebody bought CSI, and it just died. A lot of people in the, in the industry had problems with them because these reports because although they claim they had a disclaimer in there, they were really not that statistically valid in terms of the numbers that they put out. The problem was they were the only numbers in many years that came out in terms of people saying, oh, yes, we got attacked, and this is how we got attacked. CERT, uh, together with uh, CSO Online, or CSO, now CSO Online, uh, together with various accounting firms and the US Secret Service, started doing studies in 2004. They missed a few years, uh, and they now put them out with PricewaterhouseCoopers. There was one in 2005 that was quite interesting. This was the first and only study done of certainly computer crime as it affects businesses in America. Um, it was very interesting because it, it, it had the power of the Department of Justice, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and those people behind it. It got a much better response rate from, uh, from the survey than any of the others. Uh, over 8,000 firms participated. The, typically, the, these other reports are only about five, 600 responses, a 15% response rate. However, because it was done by proper statisticians, they had a disclaimer in there that even though it was that big, you really couldn't generalize from the results. Uh, and so they had a warning in there, which I don't know that people ever read those warnings, but sadly, it, though, was not that specific about what a security threat was, what an incident was, what a computer crime was. 22 million security incidents, but 20 million were just other, which I don't think was very helpful. And it was never been repeated. And if you ask the Department of Justice today, are you going to do another one of those? They say, no, we're not. And have you seen the Price Waterhouse Coopers report? of which I will speak more in a moment. So, 2003, we see the first academic uh, alarm over these surveys. Uh, Ryan and Jefferson looked at surveys, found that there was, because they were trying to do these anonymously, they were potentially counting as multiple companies multiple reports from people at one company. And so there really was no solid basis for the numbers and the conclusions that they were drawing. And when they asked people about what was your loss, you know, what was your average loss, and 
a whole bunch of people had responded from one company, and they all talked about the same loss, and that company happened to have a particularly bad loss, which might be why they're responding to a computer security survey, skewed the numbers off, off the chart. And this, <laughs> yeah. one of the problems with academic reports sometimes is that people don't read them and take them to heart. And so uh, almost 10 years later, we had uh, Florencio and Hurley did their report, Sex, Lies, and Cybercrime Surveys, totally tore apart uh, the way that this stuff is done. And I, I'll, in the interest of time, that's in the paper, basically the methodology just was really bad. And, and the, <laughs> The way sex came, came into it is if, and this is, many studies have shown this, if you ask men and women how many lifetime sex partners they had, the numbers don't add up. And not surprisingly, they don't add up because a few guys lie or exaggerate, shall we say. And so when you're putting together numbers, it's really easy to throw off numbers if a few people just persistently get the number wrong on one extreme or the other. And so they did a lot of statistical analysis that showed it's really not possible to rely on the surveys as they were being done, with these small numbers that weren't verified data input and so on. And even if you do a large study, it's going to be hard to get good answers. So is there any upside to surveys? I think there is, and I think that if you ask people what they think about crime, that is not necessarily going to help the risk manager who's deciding between this type of threat to defend against and that type of threat to defend against and making relative judgments of that nature. But if you're trying to get, say, more money for policing crime, and you could show that crime is affecting people through a survey where people's opinions are not subject to those same problems of, yes, it was $5 I lost or $100 I lost. It's their opinion as to what they're doing. Um, it can be helpful. And there is something called the EU Barometer, a series of statistical studies done by the EU, <coughs> by the government, where they survey 1,000 people in each of 27 countries, and they do one every couple of years on cybercrime, and that shows in the last two uh, studies that people are less, some people are less likely to use the internet for commercial transactions because of cybercrime. And there was some, some good secondary analysis has been done of that that shows that even when you adjust for various things, yes, cybercrime is making people nervous. And so if you could get the money to a cybercrime reduction program, and then you did a survey and it showed that people were like, oh, I feel better about the internet now. I'm going to use it more. That would be useful information. But if you did the survey and found that the way things are going and all of the uh, ransomware, the malware, and the bad things that are happening, less and less people are using the internet, well, that might help you get more money or more interest in solving the problem. Reports about things that actually happened are also useful. So the Verizon data breach uh, investigation report comes out every year. Very interesting. But you have to read the small print, which says this is based on the people who reported things to us. Right? So of, you know, one of the numbers in uh, this year's was that malware on mobile devices is not a problem. It's just not a problem uh, for the people who responded and reported to the Verizon data breach investigation report. I'd contend it's a bit more of a problem than no problem at all. But again, you have to look at what is being measured by whom, and uh, you have to disclaim that appropriately. And just as an indication of how far off we are. You know, Larry Poneman, the Poneman Institute, has been doing this um, calculation of the cost per record in a security breach. I think their latest number globally was $145. The Verizon DBR said it was 58 cents. Actually, I'm very suspicious. When I did the math and it was exactly 250 less than Larry's number, I'm like, oh, that sounds, you know, it wasn't 247x. It was exactly. 250x. And if we've got that much of a gap, can we really say we know how big of a problem cybercrime is? We need to be able to give better answers. I, is there anybody from PricewaterhouseCoopers here? No? OK. That's funny. When I asked that, a lady at the back held up a sign saying 10. I'm like, there's 10 people from PricewaterhouseCoopers here? Um, so 
if I've got that much time, um, let me see. I might have the Price Waterhouse Coopers report with me. Because this is kind of the problem we've got at the moment, certainly in America, is the government's basically abdicated tracking cybercrime. Not quite sure why, uh, maybe just lazy, but this is, th this is what you get, right? Uh, there's very few statistics in here. There's a lot of waffle about um, how to run your company and manage things and problems around the world. And yes, there's 48% more cybercrime now than there was a year ago. And you're like, really? How can you tell? Um, there's only about 659 responses make this thing up. And if you get a hold of PricewaterhouseCoopers, you say, I'm, I'm researching cybersecurity. I'm, I'm, I am officially an enrolled student at a university. Can I get the numbers so I can do some more research? No. They are um, proprietary. And it really annoys me because they're using the United States Secret Service and CERT to help them get these numbers, and yet the numbers are proprietary. And We've got to do better than that. We've got to have some better numbers coming from a source which doesn't, shall we say, sell security services. So maybe what we need is a code of conduct. Right? Maybe, as certainly as information security professionals, uh, we, we would pledge to never cite cybercrime statistics without the appropriate caveats. Say, look. This is what we found. This is how we found it. This may not be a representative sample. And, and to be honest, a lot of studies put that in there. Price Waterhouse Coopers has dropped it completely. But the CSI always used to put that in there. And, and certainly Verizon puts it in there. By the way, folks, this is just amongst the people that we got uh, reports from. I will always state exactly what is being measured and by whom. Um, Give you a moment to read that. Maybe people aren't reading it. I, I, when I first did these slides, I was going to put a picture in here, and I forgot. So last night, I put ads cool stock photo here to spice things up for the BV 2015 audience. Maybe mention lunchtime, which is almost here. OK, and, and I'm still writing this, so there's a bullet point to be added on. And maybe if we want to discuss this later in the day, I'm going to be here all week. Uh, I'd be interested in this as, as something which maybe we can do in the industry is be more proactive about how we convey numbers to people. And, and all of us probably have a marketing department somewhere that we, we need to talk to uh, whenever they start using numbers uh, to use them sensibly and appropriately. But I don't think that the effort to measure cybercrime is a waste of time. Because here's crime that I showed before, right? Starts to come down around about, ooh, let's see, 92, 96 in that range there. So what if it didn't go down, but it just moved online, right? What if we haven't had a crime drop, really? It's just moved into cyberspace. So even if the news is bad, we need to know, because that much might have moved into cyberspace. Or it might be that much. We don't, at this point in time, know. So with that, I will, uh, I will end. And uh, thank you for your attention. Um, WeLiveSecurity.com is where myself and other people from ESET publish their research. I'm Stephen Cobb at ESET.com, Zucob on Twitter and SlideShare. Uh, and that's a micrometer, for those who can remember what micrometers were. That was actually made in the Midlands in England where I grew up. And I, I've got a couple of minutes for questions, one or two questions. Are there any questions for Stephen? Lunch is probably looming large in people's minds. So Stephen, am I right to assume that that last slide you showed where property crime is going down you don't really have stats showing cybercrime going up to Oh, correlate. yes. Yeah. So there are stats. Um, IC3, which is
which I don't think I mentioned, but it was on the slide there. The Internet Crime and Complaint Center, which is an FBI project, has been taking numbers and publishing numbers since 2000 on fraud related to the Internet. And those numbers go like that. The problem is they haven't been consistent about how they collected them and counted them. They take some reports from outside of America, so it, it's not a, certainly from an academic point of view, a terribly clean data set. Yeah, uh, the, pretty much every line that tries to measure cybercrime, yes, it does go up. Price Waterhouse Coopers, it went up 48% last year. It's going like that. What is difficult, though, without really solid objective numbers, is to then take that argument and beat over the head those persons who could put out more money to solve the problem. Super, thank you. Can you join me in thanking Steve for a great presentation? Thank you.